Welcome back to my disembodied voice. Well, the other week, me and Mrs. Crow finished Hijack on Apple TV Plus, and after a while to process my thoughts and reflect, I felt it was a good example and I could use it to highlight some truly ineffectual villains. Now, for the record, I'm not reviewing the series, although, to be honest, I quite liked it. Instead, I'm looking at the villains through a psychological prism and also discussing the philosophy of how villainy has changed over the years and how we should demand more congruence, depth and quality from our bad guys and gals who are on screen. Oh, and before I start, I'm going to discuss the whole series of Hijack in depth, so there's going to be spoilers and you have been warned. Times are changing, dear viewer. Some things for the better and other things for the worse. Take the BFI, or British Film Institute, for example. As of 2018, the BFI will no longer greenlight scripts where the villain has a facial scar after partnering with a campaign by the charity Changing Faces. Now, whilst I'm not a fan of any identity politics or campaigns influencing films or TV, I'm also for progression and change, but primarily I'm all about characterization and authenticity when it comes to villains on screen. For me, there are seminal villains who have made their mark across celluloid, but one of the most important came in 1991 when we met Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter. After the excess of the 80s blockbuster villains and the slightly one-dimensional serial slashers who had dominated the horror genre, Lecter was everything you didn't expect from a leading villain. He was quiet, well-spoken, educated, loved fine arts and food, and was so dangerous he was kept in a perspex box at the end of a dungeon. From Dr Chilton building him up with horror stories all the way through to the FBI legends about how manipulative Lecter was, he was presented as a calm and taciturn man with manners, etiquette, but who, upon a flip of a dime, would peel the face off someone without breaking a sweat. Far from a cackling megalomaniac or silent psychosexual slaughterer, there was something terrifying but almost universally accepted that Lecter was what a psychopath should look like in terms of how he acted and his body language. His Machiavellianism, non-verbal gestures, narcissism, body language, his paradoxical decency and even the contraptions used to muzzle him as they denoted the greatest danger was his mouth all added to what we just seemed to know was a congruent representation of someone who was a true psychopath. Lecter was actually based on a man called Alfredo Bali Trevino who was in a Mexican prison while the author Thomas Harris worked as a journalist and maybe another reason why Lecter was so authentic is because he comes from a real human being and not a textbook or a studio or actor expectations of what a psychopath should look like at that moment in history. Now I talked about a universal acceptance of what a psychopath should be, but what do I mean when I say universal acceptance? Well, according to Hervey Cleckley, who wrote The Mask of Sanity, clinicians and so forth can diagnose things like antisocial personality disorder and mental illness, but when it comes to a psychopath and the way that they act and what they are, we instinctively know as people. That's because, in terms of psychopaths, we identify them on a continuum of traits and ticks as they destroy people's lives. So, lack of empathy, Machiavellianism, grandiosity, easily bored, egocentricity, and often an enjoyment of cruelty. Most psychopaths function day to day and don't stand out, and that's what makes them so scary. Also, they have a dissonance and an incongruence which causes our internal risk assessments, human assumptions and expectations to become uncomfortable. For example, Lecter is supremely intelligent yet also completely insane at the same time. It's a wonderful paradox. Lecter is also charming and has manners yet, as we know, and again paradoxically, he eats tongues, cuts off faces, wears faces and just eats people. But it's the fact that he isn't a cackling monster, sat in his own feces, planning sexual sadism by drawing Dr. Chilton being raped and all those other kind of stereotypes. It shows that we have an incongruent opposite and straight away his placidity, intelligence and almost calmness and mannerisms make us slightly uncomfortable. Here is a man held in a prison, in a dungeon, yet he says good morning. Thank you. Please. 
and has a wonderful set of drawings around him, loves fine food. He is a walking incongruence that just makes us uncomfortable. A lover of fine foods, wine, music and art, Lecter is an intellectual and has functioned for many years without being caught. Now this mirrors real life because take Charles Cullen, who was a supremely helpful nurse who slaughtered his patients and was so benign, he killed many people and went unnoticed for many years. In the UK, where I live, many years ago, Beverly Allett and the recent arrest of baby killer Lucy Letby also shows that people in positions of trust, members of society who are highly regarded and acted very normal and had no impact upon people's concerns were in fact cold psychopaths, whilst not necessarily troubling the fictional lector in terms of IQ, were clever enough to con their way into positions of trust and actually seem normal, contrite and helpful that they avoided detection until the eventual unavoidable patterns were noticed by colleagues. Since Hannibal Lecter, we have had some standout villains from the antisocial personality disorder of Heath Ledger's Joker to the idiopathic psychopath that is Anton Shigura. Don't worry, I intend to cover him in more depth in the video soon. All the way to universal mass murderer Thanos in Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. Now, you might roll your eyes at Thanos, but he comes from a fascinating psychological perspective. Thanos lived on the planet Titan and watched his world and people die. He saw death, starvation and war and, in the end, suggested a plan to kill half the population so there was enough resources to go around. And, much like if someone did that here, the suggestion was laughed at and, for someone who is a cold narcissist, Thanos was then unable to get over this wound to his ego. Therefore, when he finally gets all the Infinity Stones and can change the whole of reality, rather than snap more sustenance and resources into life, he chooses to wipe out half of life. This is because Thanos has an extroverted aggression rather than an introverted aggression. His mission is his philosophy and, regardless of how bonkers it is, he is determined to show everyone that he was right because, as a narcissist and a psychopath, he would rather kill his own daughter and wipe out billions than show that an alternative was better than his idea. Thanos had the best idea ever, according to Thanos. He was ridiculed. That stuck like an emotional scar. Therefore, he is never going to deviate from that as a narcissist and a psychopath because he is going to show you that his method is right. So, rather than create more life and resources, he wipes it out and says, job done should have listened to me. Look at what great things I've done now. It's all based around his psychology. Pride, egoism, hatred of his previous dismissal and also living in a high expressed emotional society where everything was fought for and there was a constant fear of not having basics like food or water like someone might do now in war-tour Ukraine or Syria. The neuronal connectors don't follow lateral thought due to the ingrained experience of living in that reality. We are products of our environment is a bit of a simpler way of saying it, I suppose. Thanos needed to show everyone that his idea was right and because it's his life work and he is convinced that he is doing the right thing and bear in mind it comes from an experience of being a child in starvation and struggling to fight his way to the top, the aggressive extrovert takes over and he sees his act as merciful rather than the butchery it is. Therefore, the very notion of giving people more is not an option because when people have more, they only ever want more. They don't suffer like the person who experienced suffering had to suffer. They won't learn like Thanos had to, and they won't appreciate the basic luxuries that they are given upon his new universe being created. After all, luxuries should be a privilege and not a right. Another type of villain is someone like Bane from The Dark Knight Rises or The Terminator from The Terminator. These guys are strong, massive, use brawn as well as brain, and they are truly unstoppable, unassailable and literal monsters amongst men. These villains have no remorse and are radical to their cause. Let's leave the Terminator as he is a robot and therefore doesn't have a conscience or neurologically developed personality and stay with Bane, who is shrewd, 
calculating like all psychopaths and he belongs to a collective philosophy in the League of Shadows where cities are taken back to the Stone Age once they become too decadent and corrupt. Bane is a really deep villain because deformed and needing his mask of pain-killing medicine or venom fluid in the comics for his strength, you can't fight him in hand-to-hand -hand combat and nothing is ever going to detract him from his radicalised cause. And that's the really interesting point where we segue into the hijackers in the series Hijack. Now, part of the reason I was desperate to watch Hijack and actually subscribe to Apple TV to do so wasn't just because of the gorgeous Idris Elba, who I love to bits, but also because of the British actor who was playing the bad guy, Neil Maskell. Now, if you like low budget British revenge films, you may have seen Maskell as the titular character in the film Bull. Now, whether it's arm chopping, mother suffocating, severing fingers as a method of torture, stabbing men and women alike, or just scaring a father who's with his two young children, Bull is a terrifying protagonist. And he's the good guy in the film. So my disappointment at seeing Neil Maskell genuinely neutered, constantly in a flux of morality and genuinely nervous in times of distress during Hijack was really disappointing. Anyway, the villains in Hijack are an ethnically diverse collection of British nationals and we know they are British nationals because we are told this when the plane is about to be shot down and the government need to identify the hijackers are not religious extremists. Actually, in terms of just showing how British they are, it's actually a good guy Arab who gets injured when the passengers attempt one of their many fightbacks. I feel that actually having an Arab injured wasn't an accidental placing in the film either. I think it was deliberately to show, look, here we have, they are good and our British guys, well, they're bad. So we have a black guy, an attractive Caucasian female who looks like she belongs in a teenage soap opera set in a college, an ASOS male model, an elderly hipster, and of course, Neil Maskell as their leader. Now, a villain needs to have two things above all else to be truly terrifying and put us in genuine fear for our protagonists. They need a philosophy and they also need to be insurmountable. Even if that doesn't mean they're stronger, they need to have no limits because our good guys always have boundaries and limits, so our villain needs to be the opposite. The philosophy of the diverse hijackers is something something shares on a something plane crash stock market, something release a criminal or something. And in terms of them being insurmountable, when we discover that the beautiful Idris Elba is a corporate negotiator for a living, we need them to be so radicalised and brutal that every role of Elba's intellectual dice is going to have us on the edge of our seats. You see, in shows like this, we are actively engaging in the story. We are placing ourselves in what we would do in that situation, how we would react, who we like and don't like if they had to die, what's going to happen next, and getting involved in the mental chess between the villain and the hero. The problem is that our diverse band of hijackers are so useless and existentially wobbly in the face of adversity that you wonder how on earth they were recruited in the first place. The men they release from prison on the ground are pretty decent in terms of being ruthless, and even the cleaners who are taking care of bears nears on the ground aren't messing about, but in the air, Maskell and his hijackers flake at every turn. They are reticent to kill people, have to keep reminding each other to follow the cause, panic when someone gets shot, panic when the passengers start to revolt, get talked out of any concerns whenever things like the plane changes trajectory, and when one of them is dying, they need Idris Elba's advice more than taking control or showing retribution. Now, I'm not saying there should be a masked villain wheezing at the front like Darth Bane, but for Elba to be put through the mill, there needs to be a leader who cannot be negotiated with, or at the very least, when Elba starts to take control, his efforts should lead to the death of a passenger or two, and then he can see what cost an error will have. Neil Maskell isn't the biggest of lads, but he's a screen presence, and every time a problem occurs, he either needs reassurance or starts negotiating a more reasonable outcome. Even when the bad guy on the ground demands a photo of a dead passenger as punishment for being followed, the hijackers start worrying as they don't really like killing people and don't want to do an eeny meeny miny mo moment. Now, I'm not saying all the hijackers need to be sadists, and a seven episode series of people being killed does not make a good thriller, but when all of them are so conflicted, existential and pussyfoot in the face of adversity, it doesn't really raise the fear levels. Having a weak link for Elba to work with is fine, and the idea of the plane being shot down so the hijackers briefly have to work with him and build that relationship is brilliant, 
but without your true psychopath at the helm, you don't feel the power and control and gravitas of your villains. Imagine if there was a seven foot monster at the front of the plane who doesn't say a word, is so radicalised and devoted to the cause that he would crash the plane and batter Idris Elba to death with one hand tied behind his back so Idris has to work on the weaker ones because going for the head honcho would be suicide. Or if any point that head honcho got wind of what was going on, he would kill a passenger. Or how about if Neil Maskell was a true idiopathic psychopath, either believing in his cause, just having fun, or enjoying watching people emote a fear that he doesn't understand because he doesn't feel normal emotions. Psychopaths are known to love chaos and excitement via torment and suffering as they themselves don't feel things the normal way, so it's amusing to see how other people react to something they don't understand. The plane is an encased metal tube high in the air with no escape, but as the series goes on, you do start to feel that the hijackers are out of their depth and the passengers could just take them all down quite easily. Idris Elba's leading character should feel helpless, attempt to plan, suffer the consequences of that plan, lose and then adapt as he comes to terms with the consequences. Trying to negotiate with a psychopath is pointless, but as he is a corporate negotiator, using his manipulation of the politicians and also suffering the mistrust of the passengers was surely the most pertinent path to follow. Take the biology of psychopathy and, in a study by Hare in 1978, he found most people's pulse and nerves react to threats and stimulus, while those of a psychopath don't. Remember the scene in Silence of the Lambs where Chilton states Lecter's pulse rate never went above 85 even when he ate her tongue? And that's a raw tongue, by the way, pulled out of someone's mouth by Lecter's own teeth, not sautéed and served with a bottle of wine whilst watching Saturday Night Live. And take Bane's assault on the plane in The Dark Knight Rises, where, even with guns pointed at him and the threat of being thrown out the plane, he remains as calm as you like. Now, I have no issue with one of the hijackers having a moment of existentialism inside their radicalised thought processes, but when the main leader is about as focused and calm as me if a gang of teenagers started walking behind me on the way home from work, or having moments where his entire philosophy is tested because Idris Elba is bending his ear a bit too much, believability, dynamics and viewer engagement is severely tested. And let's not forget the final awful confrontation as Neil Maskell and Idris Elba face off in the plane and little more than a quick stalk around the cabin before, oh, the phone's in the toilet happens and then the job's done. Radicalised people absorb a belief system and it becomes their entire philosophy. And I don't just mean something like Islamic radicalization. People watching 24-hour news networks or political vloggers on YouTube can absorb an ideology and any threats to that is met with anger, resistance and denial. And, in terms of psychopathy, if your villain is going to become an anxious and crisis-riddled person, then you're going to lose the fear factor. Now, whilst the BFI may not want facially scarred villains because, and rightly so, not all scarred people are evil, that's fine. Disney Star Wars also saw a similar thread with the villain in episodes 7, 8 and 9, as Kylo Ren started off with a helmet, but before you knew it, he took it off and he was fine and quite normal looking. But that doesn't mean we can't have scary looking, masked or just monstrous villains who frighten you with their actions, their facial features, their look, their tone. Everything should go into making you quite worried while you're sat on the sofa eating your popcorn and watching the series. Villains are what make movies and TV shows and get everyone talking and I don't want to see psychologically and emotionally accurate bad guys replaced with quotas about showing both sides, not demonising, context to why they're evil. Sometimes you just want someone who scares the bejesus out of you and you go, my god that was cool. Hijack painted its annoying and dislikable passengers with very broad strokes and they did it quite well. Mrs Crow next to me even said, I hope she dies when talking about the obnoxious mother of two children who was deliberately set up to irritate the viewer and be reminiscent of every stupid passenger you've ever sat by and it worked to treat. The same works with villains. Show them as cold-blooded monsters who slaughter people. Not so you go, oh, I hope they kill someone again, but you're there like, oh God, I hope they don't make that person angry again because I don't want to see how far they would go. If they do that when they're slightly annoyed, imagine if Idris makes a mistake and they go mental. It's something you should be worried about. 
those people crossing the line, those people going full psychotic or those people going into full blown psychopath mode. So hijacks villains were insipid, boring, flaky, and at the end of the day, not very intimidating or memorable. As I said at the start, I quite enjoyed the series and I liked quite a lot of it. The scenes with Elba's son trying to evade the hitmen were great and the former manager of Hotel Babylon tricking those cleaners out of the house was also a pretty clever scene. I also love Idris whatever he does and I like the idea of a corporate man suddenly having responsibility for a group of real people, passengers and the general public but never really out of his depth and surrounded by a cartel of hijackers that hated killing people and didn't want confrontation really. Hijack was a bit bland at times. Anyway, that's it for this week's video. So remember, psychology is cool. Please leave a like or a comment as they always engage and generate good debate or even a suggestion for a future video. And until next time, I'll catch you later. You don't tell me what happened to Aiden. I'm gonna make you eat that little knife you're holding.